Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Noah Dresner. I'm an associate professor and program coordinator of the Higher and Post-Secondary Education Program here at TC. Uh, thank you all for all the guests that are outside of TC that are coming here to support uh, Dr. Mobley. Uh, we welcome you, and thanks to all of the students uh, in our program and other departments that uh, are here tonight to hear Steve's talk. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, Dr. Mobley for quite some time. Uh, I was finishing up my doctoral program at Penn when Steve showed up as a young master's student and we fast became friends, not realizing that when uh, a few years later um, he would be uh, joining me uh, at the University of Maryland uh, as a doctoral student and I as his eventual uh, advisor. We have had a wonderful over 10 year um, uh, career working together in higher education and on his research. And I'm just so privileged that um, after uh, this past May to have put in him and been able to be the first person to call him Dr. Mobley that I got to also invite him here tonight to give his first talk after his uh, dissertation defense um, at another institution. So we're going to have a wonderful evening, I promise. Uh, and Steve's not going to disappoint. So a little bit about Steve uh, D. Mobley Jr. has dedicated his life to enhancing the post-secondary educational experiences of underrepresented students. Dr. Mobley has uh, worked extensively in the field of higher education. He is currently the Associate Director of Undergraduate Programs at Georgetown's uh, Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Prior to arriving at Georgetown, he held academic affairs appointments at the University of Maryland and taught courses in a number of different programs there, including the College of Education, the Department of Undergraduate Studies, and TRIO programs. He's served as the Washington, D.C. community um, as a college access advocate and spearheaded several uh, higher education initiatives in conjunction with the Latin American Youth Center Upward Bound Programs and the District of Columbia College Access Program. Dr. Mobley earned his BA in Communications and Culture from Howard University. I know there's quite a few Howard alumni. Welcome, Bisons. Um, upon graduating from Howard, he completed his master's degree in higher education, as I mentioned, from the University of Pennsylvania, and most uh, recently earned his PhD in higher education from the University of Maryland. His research focuses both on the historical, historical and contemporary advancements of historically black colleges and university, uh, uh, universities. Specifically, Dr. Mobley uh, research, research highlights the understudy facets of HBCU communities and underscores issues surrounding race, social class, and sexuality. And it is my privilege to bring to you Dr. Mobley. Good evening, everybody. Um, it is really, really good to be here, and I hope that you all um, enjoy my talk. So before I get started, um, I really want to provide some context and play a clip from one of my favorite shows in the entire world, A Different World, to set some context <laughs> into really um, what's happening on HBCU campuses regarding social class. Hey, baby girl. Hey, Grover. Look, I just want to explain the essay tonight. I didn't. It's all right. You did what you had to do to stay in school. Besides, you never would have won any awards writing about me. I didn't say that. And you didn't have to. I may not have been Ward Cleaver, but I wasn't Eldridge either. What was that Black Panther stuff? Well, like you just said, I had to do what I had to do to stay in school. I guess it's just getting by. Baby girl, I'm so proud. And I have to be moving on, so uh, I just came by to give you this. Where'd you get that? The track? Hey, don't ask questions you know the answer to. Well, I don't see the point in taking it. You just call me in two weeks in trouble again. 
and ask for it back. It seems like both of us get into sticky situations from time to time. Yeah, well, when does it end? The hustling, the gambling. I am so sick and tired of wondering where you are, what you're doing, and who's going to catch up to you. Girl, you can't keep living like this. I can't keep living like this. Baby, we always got by. Yeah, well, I'm sick of getting by. I scared my way into this school with that engineering scholarship and I got caught. I'm busted. And I'm tired of lying. Yeah. Then why did you accept the journalism scholarship? Because I'm just like you. What did you say in that essay? Something like, create your own destiny and make your name count. Maybe if you can make that up, you can make it true. It's easier said than done. I hope I taught you more than three card Monty. It's on you, baby girl. You know, you my one and only. I love you. I love you too, Cole. <sighs> Professor Foss, you can ask me for a second? Say this, but... All right, so now welcome again to my talk. Um, I played that A Different World clip to set some um, pivotal context for what I'm going to be discussing today discussing today, which is um, really some social class issues that are going on within elite HBCU context. So really, um, the experience that I have chosen to study are the experiences of low-income African-American students and how they experience these elite HBCU contexts. So I'll start off with Lena James. Meet Lena James. So who is she? She was a fictional character in a different world. Um, for those of you all that are not familiar with the show, it aired for six seasons. It was groundbreaking. Um, and it featured um, the lives of what it was like to live on an HBCU campus. But although it aired for six seasons, I really um, was struck because, you know, I love this show, but I'm, I'm a very strong critique. Uh, I critique it a lot now because Lena did not come on this show until season five. So this show was void of a low income representation for five seasons, um, almost on the way out. So that had me wondering, you know, did this student not fit at this context? Um, why are these stories hidden? Um, and it got into some of the themes that I was able to pull out of my um, scholarly work, including um, class passing and hiding. In that clip, Lena had written, written an essay about her um, father, and she lied about where she came from. And I started wondering, why is she doing this? But also, if you want to get some more background on her, she's often juxtaposed against one of the main characters, um, Whitley Gilbert, who is from, um, she comes from a very affluent black family, and they place a lot of language on Lena. And they say, you know, you're on financial aid. You're from the projects. And this is coming from people that look just like her. So her experience is really interesting. And although it's fictional, it does get some really good context into what I study and to what I found um, in my work. So despite a lot of the research, um, there's been thousands of articles written on HBCUs, but one of the things that remains understudied is um, social class within these contexts. And I often wonder why, and a lot of that is because this is a very hot button issue. 
um, within higher education and within the black community. We just don't like talking about class. So I said I really wanted to um, tease this out and um, a little, um, you know, background. I am, well, I was a low income African American student and I attended an elite HBC. So I really wanted to um, look at this experience. And, you know, oftentimes as a graduate student, you're reading about um, different issues. And when you don't see yourself in the literature, you become frustrated. So I really wanted to. Um, uncover and kind of unsilence these narratives that I thought had been silenced for far too long. So the guiding question of my study was what are the lived experience of social class for low-income African-American students at elite HBCUs? So then how did I frame the low-income experience within elite HBCU context? I used hermeneutic phenomenology um, that's a long word, isn't it? Phenomenology. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a critical quality of entry um, that allowed me to really get inside of this phenomenon that I wanted to study, which was what is it like for um, low-income students to experience um, social class within these environments. But out, um, from the outset, phenomenology is a study of the lived world and the lived experience. And one of the beauties of this qualitative method is that it allows the researcher to become dangerously close to the phenomenon that they have chosen to study, meaning oftentimes that they have lived what they have studied, um, which is often seen as a limitation in some qualitative research um, because you're seen as being too close. But the idea of subjectivity is really played with. Um, within this critical qualitative method. So that is one of the reasons why I really chose to um, look at this through a phenomenological lens. So another thing about phenomenology is that it uses um, phenomenological, phenomenological philosophy as an entry point into how you study um, these phenomena. So unlike other studies or unlike other qualitative traditions, which use theoretical or conceptual frameworks, these are not appropriate in qualitative um, in this qualitative method because the idea is that you're studying a phenomenon that lives and breathes in the world so how are you going to bind or control a phenomenon that you haven't even studied yet how are you going to center this with using these theories or these conceptual frameworks um, on these lives that you've yet to uncover so we use phenomenological um, philosophy as an entry and I was very deliberate and joining um, a black voices to provide a more holistic approach. So although um, I looked at hermeneutic phenomenology as a freeing um, method, it was, for lack of a better word, it's very um, Eurocentric in its views and it's very male. And I said, if I'm studying black colleges and black people, I need to join it with some black voices. So I was very deliberate in using Audre Lorde and Toni Morrison and France Fanon and W.B. Du Bois and others and really bringing these narratives to life if I had to join it with some um, with other philosophers and scholars as well. So I didn't want these um, voices of oppressed populations to be dominated or covered um, by Eurocentric um, philosophers. So in my process of engagement, I had 10 co-researchers. So I use the word co-researcher because also within hermene hermeneutic phenomenology, um, we I take out the hierarchical um, view of that's often taken. So I'm not taking from these people. I'm using them to help me to um, really, again, uncover these voices. So they're helping me and they're just as invested in this work um, as I really was. So there's a kinship that's there. So the hierarchical was taken out. So I, so back to that 10 co-researchers, I had five males and five females who all identified as low income during their attendance. So I also had a snapshot. So I used alumni between the years of 2001 and 2010 from, and I'm gonna get to the school soon, from Hampton and Howard University. And also when it came to class identification, these students identified as pale eligible um, during their time at the university. So again, I, I jumped again a little bit, but I had Howard and Hampton University um, were my sites that I used. Again, graduated between 01 to um, 2010. And I really wanted um, various region distributions I wanted at least one co-researcher to represent each region of the U.S. So I wanted the North, the South, the East, the West, and the Mid-Atlantic because social class has many faces. 
the experience of a low income um, person in the rural South is very different from someone who lives in a tenement, tenement um, in Harlem, New York. So I really wanted to capture the many faces of what it was like to be low income period to really get um, a more rich um, narrative and various very perspectives in my study. So a brief history of HBCUs. Um, these schools were established to provide higher education to black students at a time when they were denied um, the opportunity to attend predominantly white institutions. Um, historically, black colleges and universities um, were provide, were today there are 105 HBCUs and they are extremely um, diverse in nature. So I was also very deliberate um, in unpacking the elite, um, the notion of an elite HBCU. So it would have been very easy for me to call these schools private and selective in nature, and I did not want to do that. I wanted to be able to name them as elite because I felt that if we can have uh, predominantly white institutions that are referred to as um, the Ivy League, or if they are seen as elite because they are in the um, Big Ten or they are a liberal arts college, why can we not call an HBCU elite? So there are four that are in nature, four, Howard um, in DC, Morehouse in Atlanta, and Hampton um, in Virginia, and Spum, which is also in Atlanta. So these are a subjective grouping um, of colleges that are based on the um, socioeconomic status of their students and the profile um, of their alumni once they leave. I also am segmenting a specific, um, I would say, black experience. So I am looking at the students who are the descendants of um, slaves in America. So I did not look at students who um, may have um, had a, a parent that was from the Caribbean or another country because um, the, I think that, I actually quote this, um, Colin Powell once stated, my black ancestors may have been dragged to Jamaica in chains, but they were not dragged to the U.S. This is a markedly different experience than those of blacks whose ancestors were brought here in chains. I think that it was very important for me to demarcate that I was looking at um, African American students who um, were not from or represented other parts of the diaspora. Another reason I really wanted to delineate this is because another frustration that I've had when I read a lot of educational literature or just studies period, um, they lump all black people together and they don't make different um, denotations of where they come from and where they represent. So it's very important to me to really tease this out. So now let's get into the emergent themes and some of my findings that came um, out of my study. And I really um, thought that this was a process, in my opinion, of I was wading through the depths of social class and there were many. Again, these are snapshots. These are not nearly all of the themes that I found in my work, but I really just wanted to give you a taste of what I found when it came to these um, elite HBCU contexts. So, one theme was uncovering essential remembrances. Another one was the inescapable memories of class, freeing the hidden from the shadows. And another one was still waters run deep. So the first, uncovering essential remembrances. So one of them, one of, um, a lot of my participants, or co-researchers, I'm sorry, felt as if they were um, in awe when they got here. And they were like, is this wonder? or is this um, really reality? Um, Nia states, I remember just sitting there and I'm looking up and I see all the cars and all the people and I just kept thinking that it was gonna get taken away from me. She then went on to say, and so it took me about a week to realize that I was in, that they got my money, I got my housing, like I'm here for sure, because I really just didn't believe that it had all happened. So Nia came all the way from San Francisco, California. Um, she was so far away from home. And she was really caught up in wonder and she vividly recalls her first day at Howard University. Um, she arrived there in, um, in wonder and was really unsettled in her belief that her dream of, she called it that, she's like, my dream was to go to Howard. And I didn't think that this was reality for so long, that those would be taken away from me, that I somehow wasn't deserving of being here. And that was really um, pivotal for me that I thought um, that she even stated those words. So she found that this would become a new normal, um, as many of the other students did, and the unusual would become the usual. 
So that gets into, it's subtle, but it's there. The common is not always so common. So I don't know how many times that um, out of all 10 of my co-researchers, they described their time of being in the calf or the cafeteria and what that experience was like when they first got to their respective um, elite HBCUs. And I got to thinking, um, because I know, um, are you all familiar with um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting at Their Cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum? Okay. I thought that her book would be a good juxtaposition to use, uh, because that is a fairly ordinary experience. You're thinking about you're in a cafeteria, and you know, within certain um, environments, she states that minorities will clump together, and they'll sit, and they will be um, amongst themselves, but what happens when all the cafeterias are black? And how are divisions um, been made? So Alonzo states, you gotta be willing to eat lunch alone. You gotta be willing to not have plans for the weekend. I did not always feel as if these people were welcoming and inviting. I was not in their clique. I was not like them. And not only did I know this, they made it known. So it's hard. Um, he, Alonzo had a very, um, interesting story and he would talk about how you know it seems like when I got there everyone knew each other um, because they were in Jack and Jill together or because their families had known each other and he felt as if he was an outsider and he said you know this was very sobering for him because you know I went to an HBCU because I thought I was going to my own people but I don't always feel as if I'm invited um, to the table or I don't always feel as if I belong here. So it was very interesting um, how this came out. He also went on to say that, again, <laughs> all the people um, knew each other and I feel like they weren't even like making new friends at that point. How is not a place where you can just like put your tray down and say to someone in the cafeteria and they're gonna be like, so where you're from? That's not happening in Howard. He described many things um, like that, but what he um, later does um, is even more interesting where he decided when he was going to actually um, begin to evolve and merge into this um, culture. So I'm going to go into some of the memories of class that my um, co-researchers had. Um, language is a powerful thing and I think that I started to notice a lot of um, recurring things and having to push my co-researchers to name, to do some naming, to really get to the point of what are they describing. And a lot of them will use the words this, that, and it. So Nora stated, when I saw Howard during the college tour, it was kumbaya, it was fun. I saw Greek life, I saw all these smart people who look just like me. It's a feeling that it's hard to describe. But when I got there, eventually life happened. It felt different. I began to question myself, do I fit in here and do I belong? I had no idea that I would have to deal with that. It's like I just wasn't happy. I felt totally out of my comfort zone. So I stated that these memories um, and narratives were um, quite vivid um, when we started talking about the memories of class, really. Um, together we were experiencing um, a state of rememory. So Toni Morrison coined this term, uh, rememory, and it is a nod to the African belief that present and past are united and they're not separate. Yet it also demands a rewriting of past historical narratives to include the ever-present traumas. So within this state, one is called to really recall. She ultimately asserts that when one is in, the state of, in this state of reflection, they are existing all at once in their past and their presence. Places, people, and moments in time are ever-present. So she states, I used to think, I used to think it was my, my memory. You know, some things you never forget. Other things you do. Places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone. But the place, the picture of it stays. And it's not just in my memory, but out there, in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. So Nora visited this place over 10 years ago, but it was really burned into her psyche of what she went through when it came to issues of class. So really getting back to the this, that, and it, I had another student, um, another co-researcher, I'm sorry, who stated that I stopped really wanting to go home because I stopped, I stopped wanting to um, be in that. Or, you know, I was really wondering 
why they were calling social class a that, a this, or a it, and I really had to push them and nudge them along to get past using these loaded idioms to really naming what it felt like um, to be in these social class um, situations. Another common thread that, kind of, that came up often was this feeling of um, them being different. Um, I'm feeling different. And as a result of feeling different, am I wrong um, in this um, context? So summer states, again, I feel like Howard was a time, like my time at Howard was where I began to learn or be sort of awakened to the fact that like I actually lived a very different experience than everybody else. So Summer bluntly identified her time at Howard as a specific period where she felt an embodied state of being in difference. She was deeply in tune to the reality that she was immersed in her difference. She often compared herself to her more affluent peers and wondered if she would ever measure up. Many times Summer did not understand these feelings but was determined to overcome them and fit into her environment. But she would do this on her own terms. I really liked the resilience of Summer because she was like, I'm going to fit in into this environment and I'm going to do what I have to do, but it's going to be done on my own terms. I refuse to go in debt. I am not going to leave friends who I had in the past, like I've seen others, to fit in with these more fluent classmates. So she was very deliberate in saying, I'm going to do certain things, but I'm going to do them on my own terms, even though I'm feeling as if I'm in this difference. Roman was not um, so accommodating. So he talks about his experience at Hampton. He says it was a lifestyle change going from DC to Hampton. So it was just, it was a culture shock. The only thing that made it comfortable was because it was an HBCU. You was around your own kind, but even your own kind became irritating. They judge. I always had to explain myself why I dress or talk a certain way. I would get pissed. Why do I have to explain anything to you? So to me, I never really fit in the, I never fit in the situation because it was just like, that wasn't home. It wasn't family to me. It was just more of, I'm coming here to get my education, I'm gonna be out. I couldn't adapt to that lifestyle. So Roman, um, really did not enjoy how his more um, affluent, pills, affluent, peer, affluent peers were really judging him. And he really, um, I would say, always went against the grain. I really called him a rebel, but I respected him for that because he's like, I'm going to continue to embrace where I'm from, which was Washington, D.C., and I'm not going to do everything um, like the rest of my peers are. I'm not going to change the way that um, I dress. I'm not going to change the way that I speak, because they should just accept me for me. So he um, would eventually, he eventually found a community, but he was like, it's my own close-knit um, friends, and he hasn't gone back since he graduated. I think he was going to go back this year for homecoming because he's celebrating a 10-year, but before then he was like, I'm done. So that was very interesting to me also because, you know, HBCUs are known for being these welcoming environments, and people flock back to their school every year. But when you have students that are um, talking as if this wasn't the most pleasant experience, it kind of slaps that notion in the face. And, you know, I had another participant who basically stated, I was in an abusive relationship with Howard for four years. I don't want to go back and experience that again. So it was really interesting. And for the final themes, the waters run deep. I got into the notion of um, good blacks, bad blacks, good Negroes, and the bad Negro too. So, Jody David Armour says, it becomes problematic when we as black people morally distinguish amongst ourselves. There are politics that are involved, a us and them perception, if you will. Us being the good Negroes and them being the bad Negroes. The bad Negroes are those who are often poor. The good Negroes are middle class blacks. When we make those distinctions, there is an air of judgment that has created notions of a good black versus a bad black in American society that divides us. It is now time to talk about this. So when I initially um, began my exploration into what it is for a low-income student to really um, live and breathe in these elite HBCU um, campuses, I found myself boastfully declaring that I was going to break down and problematize the good blacks and bad blacks and uh, what, it, what these words really meant. Um, but I didn't know what they meant <laughs> until I started doing um, the research. They were just words. But today, there is a sobering, um, yet textile, um, tactile black fantasy that exists. Um, everyday black people contend with societal perceptions that are filled with notions of good and bad Negroes. Um, these perceptions are riddled with black stereotypes that include mammies, Uncle Toms, the Mandingos, Sapphires, and the ever-tragic mulatto. 
But how does this relate to the elite HBCU context? Um, I was speaking with another one of my co-researchers, and she basically, um, she was saying how there were these rules um, that were in place. Um, when she arrived to Hampton, they were given um, profiles of the Hampton man and the Hampton woman, and what they were and what they were not to do. So, it's like a Hampton woman is someone who um, does not yell from um, windows on campus. She does not wear a head wrap um, outside. Um, a Hampton man walks women home from campus. Um, a Hampton man does not let his pants sag. So you have these rules and these notions of um, gender and really patriarchy that are trying to seem as if they're trying to, um, she basically said, um, I said, it seems like your school is producing or making um, good Negroes. Um, and she said, well, isn't that what Hampton's always done? And I was very surprised at that um, because she basically says, you know, these schools are meant, that's what they're for. They're meant to change you. Um, so then it goes back to this kind of throwback to what an HBCU is. Um, if you look at them historically, a lot of them um, were seen um, and they did act as finishing schools. And I kind of trouble, is that what they're doing today, um, the elite HBCU? Are they there to reform? and to save, um, and what does that really look like? So secrecy and silence, silence playing the class game. This was one of my um, favorite parts of um, my study um, because I really play around with the notion of passing. Um, in 1929, Nella Larson wrote a book um, entitled Passing, and she documents um, the life of two women, one who decided to pass for white, and another one that did not decide to pass. And it really was big. Um, um, during the Hollow Renaissance, and even you know today, students are still reading um, this book on passing. But I kind of play around with that, and I say that you know today, man, passing manifests in many different manners um, than it once did in the past. Um, today, you know, you have Jews who pass as Gentiles, gay people who pass as straight, um, and so forth and so on. There's gender um, passing and all types of things. But I said there's some class passing that was going on within these elite HBCUs. And Blair really hit it um, nail on head. She said, each day I came back to my dorm room and took a shower, I would wash the day from my body. I was also cleansing myself of that same day's performance. I was attempting to remove the stench of pretending to be who I really was not. I now know I was not only pretending, but I was passing. So she was really, um, although she was a um, low-income student, she had did things or she started to perform in ways and model her peers. Um, she changed the way she dressed. She changed the way she spoke. Um, she began to not speak of, um, you know, when they asked, you know, what do your parents do? She would kind of downplay, you know, her background and really reinvent herself. But she thought that she was also really performing every day because people, these people really don't know who I am. So I really, it was she and others um, within my study really, I really said they were really, um, I'm playing the class game. They were um, class passing. And what did that look like? It was very um, fascinating to talk about it was. So now getting to the end um, with some of my pedagogical insights. So I start off um, my pedagogical insights um, by this quote from Vanessa Williams. And she said this in her um, Oprah's master class. And she states, you know, with my generation and the elders of our generation, people didn't talk about the experiences that haunted them or that were disturbing. They were left unsaid. So there are a lot of mysteries within African-American society. We don't know a lot of the stories that have happened because of the fact that people don't talk about everything. So when I first told um, my advisor, Noah Dresner, mm -hmm. um, and others um, in my life, friends, um, family, people on the street, because I was excited about this topic, <laughs> um, they would just say, are you sure you want to go there? Or, you know, oh, Steve, don't go there, you know? And after a while, I'm like, well, where's there? And wherever it is, I'm going to go there. <laughs> um, because I need to find out what's going on um, in this study. So there really is a metaphor that's been placed before me many times um, during my study. And I really thought that it was important for me to go there because just as Vanessa Williams stated, you know, I think it's high time for um, black communities and even educational communities to begin talking about these issues and they don't need to be remain um, shrouded in these taboos and these secrecy. 
So then I began to look beyond what I deemed my co-researchers as my perfect 10. So Emmanuel, one of my co-researchers stated, I have a little cousin that went to Howard. He left after a semester. And I know that it's, it's not for everybody. He was not willing to accept the culture. He just wanted to go to school. I'm still trying. I still grapple with it. He said, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to grapple with this. So in looking beyond my perfect 10, I really started to think about those students who I wasn't able to talk to, who leave these universities because of some of the rigid cultural norms um, and traditions. And even those students who may have left higher education altogether, never to return, because of their experience of these schools that are you know, touted as you know, um, rich and supportive and accepting. So I really began to want to look beyond my perfect 10 to just think about and really have these schools, or even the HBC communities, period, take a closer look at themselves to see why are students leaving and what's really going on with these cultures. Not lose the cultures, but really just look at them to see why they're not for, you know, you might say to everybody. And then I really like, um, I'm going to end this off with um, my final words when you start to start to dialogue um, from Stokely Carmichael. So throughout my entire study, um, again, because these um, stories, I keep calling them hidden because they were, they were hidden from me. And I'm pretty sure they're hidden from a lot of you all. I really had to dig deeply to find stories of people who were low income <coughs> or first generation and how they endured these environments. And most of them came from memoirs. So I found and stumbled upon Stokely Carmichael's. Um, I did another one with um, Ossie Davis um, and Zora Neale Hurston. Um, even the new book with Tony Hesey Coates. They, they, they chronicle, and ironically, they're all Howard alum, but um, they really <laughs> chronicle um, these places and they really talk about these class um, contexts and how they struggle with that. And I think that each of them went there in different generations but are saying the same things was very interesting to me. So I'm going to end on this note, because it's very complex. How I presented me with every dialectic existing in the African community. At Howard, on any given day, one might meet every black thing and its opposite. The place was a veritable tissue of contradiction, embodying the, embodying the best and the absolute worst values of the African American tradition. Howard's most egregious image in the African community was as in an elitist conclave, a bougie school, where fraternities and sororities, partying, shade consciousness, conspicuous consumption, status anxiety, and class and color snobbery dominated the student body. Was this true? Certainly to some extent, but while this aspect was for some very visible, it was, give thanks, by no means, the whole story. Mm -hmm. I really like how he says this. He calls it out and he names it, just as I've attempted to do, but this is one snapshot of the story. But it's an important one. And again, I'm glad how he called it out. And it was very important for me to read this because he states this is a part of the story, but it's not the entire story. And that's really what I wanted to convey throughout my entire work. But these are pieces, they're important pieces, but not the entire piece. It's just one piece that hasn't been talked about very often. of social class until I left. So that's another thing. I use alumni on purpose, because I really think that it's hard, and this is across the literature, because they have been similar studies done, but they've been based on predominantly white institutions and white students and how they experience social class within higher education environments. And it's really hard for people to name what they're going through while they're going through it. I, I, I would think if I would ask a senior, they can reflect back on their experiences while they're there. But I really thought it was important to get alumni because they know what they were going through. So getting back to your question, I really didn't understand or remember a lot of things that occurred to me with regard to class until I was gone. So I couldn't, like I write about um, in one of my chapters, you know, what the experience was like, which really was an inspiration for dissertation, reading Our Kind of People by Lawrence Otis Graham while I was a Howard student and having my peers stop me and say my family's in this book 
or look on page 23, that's my grandmother. And I was like, I'm going to school with these people. Like, this is insane. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a great experience. It really helped me to grow. Um, but I also didn't realize how much I had changed until I started to come home. So I did encounter a lot of this change in the way that I spoke or the way that I dressed. And I know my mother, she stated one time, she's like, you just have that Howard stink all over you. <laughs> um, and what does that mean? So it was really, really good. But um, <coughs> looking back, it, it was some definitely some class things that were going on. And I think that when you do get in different groups, people can kind of reflect backwards and articulate those things. But I think when you're going through it, and someone asks you, oh, where are you summering this summer? And you respond, I'm working. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't hit a light bulb. Um, I didn't feel offended then. I kind of offended now, like, summer. <laughs> I'm not being invited to my office meeting. So, you know. <laughs> What's going on? Yep. Um, and in this study, I really do make it a point at the very end to say that we need to start being honest with low-income students, just like you're having the, the conversation with them, like, if you're going to be going to an Ivy League school, this is what you should expect. I think that the conversation should be had earlier. I don't think that anybody should um, experience this culture shock just raw without any um, experience. So with that being said, I am not in the business of not sending low-income students to these schools because these schools need them as much as they need them. You see, it's reciprocal. There's a relationship that happens at these places because if they don't, they will become, um, ver they should not ever be homogeneous. There needs to be a richness in culture and of experience. So I would just be very honest. And, you know, Roman was very hard, but at the same time he did, he was in the band. So, you know, I think that kept him there and also the scholarship didn't help. And then Hampton has a very strong culture of, they talk about, the, I about all of them do, and even other alum that I know that aren't even in this, they talk about these big brothers and big sisters. So they have a very strong culture of these upperclassmen who are determined to find underclassmen to help. So there was a young lady who um, saw that he was being very despondent in an office when he was in a summer program. And she was like, I'm gonna help you. And she kind of stayed on him and he was like, she just won't leave me alone. <laughs> but he was glad that she did that. So I mean, I think that the environments are tough. Um, and even when Nora was saying, you know, there are days when, you know, you're alone or, you know, you see your friends driving these cars and I'm on the bus and it's raining and it's hard. I think that you have to have, a, um, there's a decision that was made by all of them to stay. So I think that what was special about these students because they were high achieving is that they were, they had a spirit of resilience and they wanted to stay. But there were some that were just like, I came this close to transferring, but then something else intervened and happened. So I'm not in the business of telling these kids not to go, but I think that there's better preparation that can happen. And there are some things that these schools can do while they're there to make them feel um, much more comfortable. Because I don't think that they're, I think that they're aware, but again, we don't want to talk about class issues. So I think that that would be very interesting to have um, low-income students at these schools have a similar bridge program or preparation that occurs at predominantly white institutions. Um, I think that it should happen. But what, what would it look like is another question. Hmm. Do, do you think those bridge programs at HBCUs would single people out? Single them out how? It would shine light on that particular individual that they are different. Um, and not only that, but their peers would see them as different because they are in these 
quote unquote bridge program. So here's the thing, Roman was in a program um, that he had to be in because he was not up to par, quote unquote, he had a, had a low SAT score and he was there already over the summertime to help them in a summer class. Or So these students are already on these campuses in these programs um, having to you know, get some extra academic skills and they fit the profile. I think that if they were to add a component of some other preparation, some social preparation, which is needed, I think that it could be under that guise. It just needs to be slid in because they're doing so many other things um, with these overt and covert cultural norms when it comes to making them become, you know, from these bad blacks into good blacks. I don't think that it would shine a light because I think that everybody is going through a process. But I think that if they were to just slide in these, um, these different preparations and some of these other bridge programs that are just strictly academic, it could be helpful. So maybe that wouldn't single them out so much. Yeah, so um, HBCUs, Talladega College, class of 1987. And a lot of the um, quotes you have from your co-researchers, again, like you said, it was going on then, it's still going on now. I heard even back then. So my question is, was it specific that you wanted to do the elite HBCUs? You you get a better sampling, focusing on those four versus any HBCUs? Because I think some of that class distinction happens at all of them. Yes. So I really, um, I was very deliberate in calculating and wanting to drive this point home. So I was very selfish with this research because I really wanted to just drive the point home. I also wanted to make it a point to, um, I could have done all HBCUs, right? But again, I think that there's power in this naming because even in the HBCU literature, um, they're seen as a monolithic group. So you do have the four HBCUs that are named that are being compared to just, just all other HBCUs. I thought that it should have been a distinction, just like distinctions are made in PWI literature. So I really was just being much more deliberate and focused because even when I was um, recruiting, for co-researchers, I had students from all HBCUs that were like, but like, no, this was my story. Um, I am first generation college student. Like, this is this all this stuff happened to me when I was at my respective um, HBCUs. So I think that for future research, I'm definitely going to expand and go out. But I just thought that for this, it was um, telling a unique facet and a unique story that has not been told because the low income experience at um, a lot of state schools, um, like a Morgan State or others, it's already been told, but these stories hadn't been told. And it's often done from a deficit perspective where these students are struggling. But these students weren't struggling academically, they were struggling socially. And what does that look like? And why does that lead to departure? should produce um, movers and shakers of the world, but I think that they have responsibility to their community. Um, uh, every um, Howard alum that I did speak with said they, they, they critiqued their institution in stating that it was deplorable that the, um, what they call them locals, I hate that word because I'm a DC native, <laughs> but they said that um, the locals did not feel comfortable on campus or they were not welcomed on campus. So how can this unabashedly black space not be welcoming of its community? So you're only welcoming certain types of blacks and then once people that probably are of that community, possibly like myself, you know, do slide on the campus, you're now wanting to change them. And what does that look like? So I think that there was, this, I think HBCUs period have a responsibility of racial ethos. What that looks like needs to be talked about because I think that you know, um, these black respect respectability politics and some of this heavy handed, you know, these dress codes and things like that, I don't, I don't know. It almost sounds, and I, I, I use this term in my dissertation, a new industrial education. You know, we're not teaching you to sew and to do bricks anymore, but we're definitely instilling these um, Eurocentric views of how you should operate. And does this even keep you safe? 
question. Most of your co-researchers have been out of school now for about five years. Yes. How are they now, um, speaking of majorities, not one in particular, but how are they now? Are they now the good blacks? Are they now the fluent people? And how, they're no longer, I'm assuming most of them, low income. And how do they now identify with the bad blacks? Because it's now, they're on the other side, if you will. I guess if you think, if you go were to enter college now in the um, environment that they're in now, would they be seen as the Jack and Jills now, or are they still on the other side? So you're asking very good questions. Um, <laughs> all of them are doing amazingly. Um, I think that the things that the, the, the mind can play tricks on you. So I was really placing a lot on my co-researchers with regard to wanting them to feel the most comfortable. So I said, you choose what you want to be um, spoken to. Where can we have our conversations? And they were, all these conversations occurred in places that were far cries from where they came from. I mean, there was, I had to go to Europe to visit one and we were having high tea in Kensington Park. You know, another person was, you know, um, they said, I want you to meet me at happy hour at the W, or I just bought a house, talk to me here. So they've definitely changed in that respect. Now, when it comes to the good black, bad black thing, you're some that are like, I'm no longer that. We're not going to talk about my past. And, you, and we're not talking about that right now. Like that, I'm, that's, that, you know, I was low income, but I'm far from that now. You have others that are all about building up and are like, um, I need to make sure that I'm helping out my little cousins who are trying to go to college, or I'm very active in my familial life. But they all have said that there's a perpetual return because they're different. They all feel different. They know that they're different. And what does it feel like when they do go home, um, when someone would joke and say, oh, you sound white, or oh, you think you're better. And you know, there are some that are like, well, I am better now. <laughs> you <have> others. <laughs> that are like, you know, no, you know, that's, that's not cool. You know, I'm still summer, I'm still, but even with the Jack and Joe thing, you know, one of them is now a Jack and Joe mom, so she'll call me after meetings and she's like, this is insane. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I never thought in any day that this would be happening. So it's really interesting to look at that. Um, and I, I could have just misheard, but did you mention um, focusing on the LGBT community in I did not. Okay. Okay. I did not. Only I, because I had a reason. Um I had a I had a I had a reason. I had a reason. I had a reason. I just did not I really wanted to, um I think that, that narrative it would have made it much more complicated. Um that was actually my question. Do you yeah. think that, that paired with the with the class thing? Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. Yes, it would have it would have definitely that's a whole other dissertation. <laughs> um, that's a whole presentation with how you negotiate in that aspect three oppressive entities your social class your sexuality and your race within this I'm writing that down <laughs> um, but no I, I didn't do that on purpose because I think that I just really wanted to um, that, again that could have been a whole other dissertation and that was really for future research but that is one vein of my research where I do look at um, how LGBT students do um, operate and um, encounter HBCUs, and that's also a very interesting conversation. Um, you talked about finding co-researchers from um, different regions around the country. Can you talk a little bit about um, what differences are, how that played into um, your findings at all? Yes. So, hmm. Um, even, okay, so the way they even found these schools, right? You have... This was Nia. Nia was from San Francisco, and I, I just I asked her because I was just intrigued. I'm like, how the heck did you even hear of an HBCU? Because um, there are no HBCUs on the West Coast. But she says, I was watching the Cosby Show, and I saw Claire Huxtable, and she, I found out she went to Howard. And she said, I researched this school. And then she said, she said it felt like signs. Um, everywhere she went, everywhere she listens on the music, they went to Howard, or this went to Howard. So she hadn't even visited the school. Um, so even in her college choice process, it was very different when from someone that's on the West Coast to someone who was from New York or the Mid-Atlantic, how they came to these schools and how they viewed these schools. Because some of them, um, they had just they never thought about it. Um, but that was very interesting. And even in how they, so again, I use Summer because I think it's, um, not Summer, I use Nia a lot because I think that West Coast thing was, that proximity to place was very interesting because she talks about how she even moved to campus. Because how do you move across the world when you had to raise money to even get your plane ticket? Like, she almost didn't even go to Howard. 
because she could not afford a plane ticket. And it took her program that was paying for her to get a scholarship to buy her plane ticket. So she describes this process of, um, you know, meeting an aunt um, and having one suitcase and what that looked like. Um, so when you arrive with your one suitcase and your um, classmates are arriving in an Escalade and have Louis Vuitton luggage and, you know, what does that look like or what does that do to you your first day on campus? So it was really interesting how geography played into that. Um, in the back. Um, oh, um, I'm interested to your research. Did you use strictly African Americans or did you um, venture into African and West Indian students also? I only use African Americans. Um, again, because I really wanted to um, demarcate that difference. And oh, another reason too is because uh, even people from, um, that have parents that are from Africa, Caribbean, they look at issues of race, class, sexuality very differently than those who were born and raised um, in the state. So that's another reason why um, I really wanted to use um, or document that experience. Um, thank you for your talk, it was very engaging. Um, Brian Allen, master's student at Iron Plus Secondary Ed. You talked about um, tying in black narratives of voices into the Eurocentric like theoretical frameworks that you use. Can you talk more about what that process was, was like? Um, any difficulties or frustrations? It's very hard. Um, it was very frustrating, but I knew I had to do it. Um, I'm really, I'm really fortunate too that okay. So this phenomenology thing is get, can get pretty deep because one of the founders of it um, was found out to be a Nazi. So it's even in talking about that or even reconciling that. So here I am having to use this man's work, and he is oppressed populations. And how do I use that on other oppressed populations? So I really tried to make sure I did join. So when it came to really talking about the experiences or when I got the social class. Um, so for the strict philosophy and what it means to do a um, hermeneutic phenomenology, I would stick to, um, I would say my Eurocentric voices, but I even, um, I would say, not even snuck in, but Frantz Fanon was a black philosopher. So I made sure to use him and he was a phenomenologist. But when it came to the things talking about um, what I would call, you know, similar to how um, Langston Hughes, the ways of black folk, I made sure that I didn't use those voices to talk about what it was like with live class. So I would find, you know, what Toni Morrison talked about with Remembery or, you know, what she talked about when it came to social class. Same thing with um, Audre Lorde um, and others because I just could not, I think it would have been very false of me to just use those voices and not use the others. Um, and again, it came to a point when I was getting frustrated and my co-chairs were saying, you need to add more of those voices. And I was like, I just want to graduate. So <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it was very, it was very, very interesting, but it had to be done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about um, one of the students from California and their yes. journey um, uh, out to the East Coast. Um, I guess I had a couple questions. Number one, did the students talk uh, about um, their reasons for wanting to attend an institution? I know you spoke about you see some of the institutions in popular culture and that type of thing, but the reasons for wanting to attend those specific institutions. Um, and then as well as you talked a little bit about um, how we want to speak earlier about what the cultural shock might be for these students but maybe their admissions process. So who were they talked to? How did they hear about these institutions? Who got them to come to these institutions? That type of thing. So it's kind of two areas. It was a lot of different things. So um, they all arrived there um, in many different ways. Um, college counselors were huge because they give you a list of um, you know, institutions or you should look here, you should look there. Um, a lot just, um, so Roman came because he really wanted to be in that band. He really wanted to be in the Hampton band because he was taken on a college tour when he was in high school. And he got recruited. So that's what drew him. Um, others had cultural references. Um, bar none, I think a majority of these um, individuals either applied to an in-state school, but their out-of-state schools were HBCU. So these were students also, ironically, that they knew they wanted to go to Circle by College to the University. So, um, again, another irony is that those four were also on their list. So they were looking at these schools and they would have had an interesting um, experience either way. Um, but I think that the um, kicker came when it came to visiting or when financial aid came back. Um, because another interesting thing is that all these students were on scholarships um, for rides. So that was also um, very helpful. And I think what did allow a lot of them to stay. Um, because a lot of them would say, I, I love one of them. Um, Norris said, you know, I busted out my grades the first semester. I had a 3.8. It was that other stuff 
<laughs> I didn't think that I would have to deal with. She said, I thought I was going to school. So then you start asking questions of what did this school look like? Um, what is being imparted? Um, what is this you know, experience really like if you don't, if you think that you don't have to do more than um, go to class. I was going to go to class and that was going to be that, but there was more. So the college choice process was very different um, for all of them. Family members um, recommended um, these institutions. They were, some, some of them were told from a young age, you're going to go here, you should be looking here. Um, but what's very interesting though is those that were in more of the um, mid-Atlantic region, so D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, how they ended up either at Hampton or Howard, which is very striking to me because they're both so close to home. Um, so that was a really interesting process in my opinion, too.